Right, welcome to the last session of today's event. Uh, we'll have a, a very uh, like amazing panel. Uh, for our panelists include uh, Sonia Chernova, Shiwali Mohan, Sheila Omaran, and uh, Jacob Walrock. So what we will do is uh, we will keep our time to end roughly about 5 p.m. Uh, so we have about 40 minutes. And I think for the first 25 minutes, I have a few questions that I'll ask. And uh, the panelists can uh, answer uh, whichever question they, they feel uh, uh, they want to offer. And then we will have some uh, audience questions. So uh, first, I will start with a question uh, asked all the panelists. So in your observation, what do you think are some of the effective ways AI and HCI researchers can work together? And what are some of the barriers? So what would you like to see in this space? So I think the most impactful place where HCI and AI can get together is an evaluation of AI systems. Because as AI scientists, we don't get trained in the different ways you would be evaluating a system, running experiments, doing qualitative studies, quantitative studies, and things like that. And I have always looked to HCI research to learn more, so I think that would be a really great collaboration point. Okay, so that was an AI answer for what HCI can bring. <laughs> On the HCI side, I think AI can bring a lot, a lot to what we do. Um, in fact, I think HCI is actually really getting transformed by AI very profoundly. Uh, the number of projects at the conference I just general chaired this last week, uh, where Anang was attending, um, the number of projects that incorporated some form of machine learning or other forms of AI was, I don't know, 50% almost? I mean, it's 30%, 40%. It's a huge percentage. Um, this conference is WIST, User Interface Software and Technology. So it's the technical HCI conference. Um, and of course, HCI is very broad and involves social science and design and other other topics. But along the technical lines, uh, a lot of a lot of projects involve AI, and um, I think that's just because the the ease with which um, AI can be incorporated now through libraries um, and the amount of data that can be brought to bear um, really affords interactive computing projects new avenues that just weren't there before. So for the AI folks, which is I think most of you, um, if you continue to package your breakthroughs in ways that make it easy for us to incorporate into our projects, your, your stuff will get used by us and we'll all be grateful to each other. Design good APIs. <laughs> All right, so those were great answers. I'm gonna avoid duplicating any of them and just address the other part of the question, which was the challenges to getting us all to work together. Um, I think there are so many opportunities that others have already commented and those really outweigh anything else. Uh, the challenges that faced us at the fields, I think, uh, look for slightly different evaluation, like requirements, right, in terms of what you need to publish or what you need to present your data to others and be respected. Um, and so finding a common ground where both of those are satisfied can be a little bit hard. So you sometimes want to maybe start with satisfying one and then move to the other and so on. Um, so to me, like the actual practicalities of getting both fields to respect a single work, um, sometimes you feel like you have to do a little bit of, like significantly extra. Yeah, and I think I would add, um, and Jacob uh, talked about this this morning, one thing that HCI has always struggled with is dealing with individual differences. And that's not just an accessibility, it's dealing with people who may be working in um, environments that are very different from you know, the office desk that Apple software developers work at. Um, so you know, look, looking for ways to be sensitive to the changes in environments and the differences in environments that individual users have to deal with. And I think AI can be really helpful there in having adaptive models that we can build upon. Cool, so moving on to the next question. Um, I think many of our uh, speakers today uh, touched upon how AI and uh, human are working together right, in different ways. So how AI and technology can either augment certain aspects of human ability or replaces certain tasks to automate them. 
uh, or potentially evolving together. So I want to hear your thoughts on um, which of those different kind of configurations between human and AI do you think um, you're most excited about and also uh, that, that you think deserve the most attention in the short term and the long term, perhaps? Can you repeat the choices? Like, what are we selecting from? <laughs> Multiple choice <laughs> answer, those are, please. Those are suggestions of options, but you can feel free to add any other you know, way of how. All right, I, I don't know if this is within scope, but to me, what I've been uh, observing lately, and I think maybe the HCI folks can, can contest this or not, but to, to me, technology is most successful when uh, uh, people really truly see that it benefits their, their life in some way. That's, that's what adoption means. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we uh, spin our wheels a little bit as computer scientists. We try to solve things because they're cool and we like to see the algorithm work, but it's not necessarily practical. And so um, getting back to whether it's a collaboration or not a collaboration with an AI or whatever, uh, I think uh, it needs to add value to someone's life. So it, usually that means augmenting their capabilities in some way. Uh, that's what adding value means. So I guess if out, out of those multiple choices, that's kind of where I would fall. Whatever, whatever means you use to get there, we're here to make a difference in people's lives. And that means the developing technology that they're actually going to use. <laughs> Yeah, just building on that further, um, I love that answer. And Ed Lazowska, who some of you probably have heard of, is a computer science professor at the University of Washington um, and a bit of an institution unto himself. Been there a long time. Uh, and he talks about the difference between need pull and technology push research. Uh, and uh, both, both have their place and both can be successful. Uh, in fact, many researchers do some bo of both in their careers. At least for HCI researchers, I think most of the field is oriented towards uh, need pull, and by that we mean we observe or experience a need in the world, or we see someone else experiencing a need, um, or we hear about a need, or we spend enough time with prospective users and we see their needs, and then we allow those needs to drive a research project, which is somewhat technology agnostic, right? We're just trying to find the right combination of technologies that will solve the problem. As opposed to technology push, which is a, hey, we stumbled upon this cool capability or this new thing, or what if we did this to the algorithm? What would happen then? All of those are good you know, approaches as well. But then sometimes you end up with a hammer, and now it's like, OK, we got this cool thing. Let's go find a nail, right? Um, and, and sometimes you can find a good nail, and sometimes you kind of make up the nail, too. Um, and that's OK as well. And sometimes technologies anticipate a need that's not yet there, but then we find out we can do things with it later. So again, both are really valid. Um, um, but uh, I do think for adoption, sometimes the horizon is quicker if it's need pull because you're actually seeing the need in sort of real time. Uh, technology push maybe have, have a longer horizon. So I'll take a different angle at human. I mean, it's like humans who do science. And I do think AI scientists need to approach their methods with a lot of humility and learning from other sciences, because I find that, I mean, it, 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 it could be called an algorithmic arrogance of, because I built this, I know this is correct, this is the right way to do things. And as soon as you start interacting with people who are either practitioners of that field, or are scientists who've been studying that field for a really long time, like you have to actually listen to them and understand what they're highlighting as the concerns with your methods, the constraints of your methods, and how far they would be applicable, and really listen and understand, and then try to bring it back to your own science. And that's a tough pill, but I've had to take it so many times, I feel like start learning in grad school. And I think it's also important to remember playfulness. Um, and uh, coming out of the field of computer music, it's very easy to become very serious about our art. 
even you know when we when we like to put nice algorithms there and build nice synthesizers with black box software and things inside. But it's good too to let, let people kind of investigate what artificial intelligence can and can't do and, and to sort of play with the edges of this space. We talk about this in musical performance as well. If you give somebody an algorithm, don't tie it down. Let them find where it breaks because that's actually where they become most creative. And I think possibly there are similar things that can be done with algorithms and AI. The panelists are also welcome to ask each other's follow-up questions. <laughs> okay. Um, the next thing I want to touch upon, and, and I think uh, it was touched upon in many uh, talks today as well, is the significant challenges in fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics in AI. Um, so can you talk about what are some of the unique challenges in, in the context of your work, uh, accessibility, or more broadly, that you see that need to be addressed before uh, the technology are becoming widely deployed. I haven't had much thought about this one, but I think I think how how I can phrase this. So, if you think of the case of something like Alexa um, and other um, home assistants are available, uh, one of the really unique things that happened when Alexa came along was that because it was speech-based, it opened up so many possibilities, particularly for visually impaired people. Suddenly, we could use things that we could never use before, like thermostats and um, you know some other devices like complicated washing machines and things that are enabled with that thing. Um, and because now you could see all the options and all the choices, you didn't just have to learn your particular path. And it's this idea of like path, path like knowledge versus map like knowledge. Suddenly we were able to see the whole map. Um, and so I think inadvertently, things that are developed for one context can have a huge impact in other places. And one of the challenges, I guess, is that you know, as we move forward with these technologies, not to forget the, the areas that, surprising areas that have opened up and accidentally shut them off by doing something that suddenly makes, you know, Alexa only usable if you can see what's on the, the screen of the bell or, you know, and something like that. So just keeping, you know, remembering not to, as we move forward, not to close down those wonderful options that opened up. All right, um, that's a really good reminder for all of us. I, I, when I was talking, really kind of tried to sell this idea of AI be, being a proactive assistant, whether that's a robotics assistant or a smart home that's um, providing reminders uh, or notifying your care partners when something's wrong. All of that is AI acting in a much more proactive way. Um, than today's systems. And there are significant ethical concerns and, and issues there that I'm unfortunately uh, not the most qualified person to assess, but I'm enjoying working with people who it, you know, are trained ethicists who study the impact of these technologies. Uh, but I think as, uh, you know, we were just talking about hammers and being careful developing hammers and then looking for nails, um, there's a, an ethical question of, you know, what is too much? When should technology act? What is appropriate? Uh, there are privacy concerns about what information you share with somebody. Um, what about a person who does not want help? Right, because guess what? Their health is declining, and if their doctor finds out how bad things are, they're going to lose their independence and not be able to live by themselves, and that's not what they want. So they're going to do everything they can to sabotage every single sensor you put in that home. Right? Uh, who's, wh you know, who uh, is the AI responsible to? What's the ethical situation there? Are you supposed to report stuff? Are you, is it responsible to the person that's trying to take care of, to the clinicians, to their care partners? You know, who takes priority? Who's the actual user of the system to whom the system actually has to listen if they say, delete all my data, right? And so huge, huge um, questions there that, that I don't have an answer to. Um. 
So I haven't thought about this question very deeply, and I should have. It's an important one. But as I think about it now, I think one of the concerns with um, the way we approach sustainable transportation, where we projected people's choice in the utility space and then use that to find people to whom the recommendations would work well. I think a challenge with those kinds of approaches is that it might put all the cost of a global good onto some specific people, right? So because people from poorer neighborhoods take bus more, the system that I built is likely to recommend those people to take buses for even more, right? So the um, the basically the energy consumption of the entire city comes down, sustainability increases, but it's because people from the poorer neighborhoods are spending more time and are taking non-optimal transportation choices, right? So thinking back to that through that same work, and if I had to do it all over again, I would think very deeply about what are the ways in which we can study that these kinds of biases are not getting into the recommendation part of it. And hopefully, some of the work that I learned today would flow right into it. Go ahead. We don't all have to answer everything. Yeah, yeah. Seems like a test. <laughs> OK, so one last question before I open it up to the audience is, how do your work relate to the fields, uh, uh, other fields beyond computer science and uh, HCI AI, such as healthcare and policy making and law making, et cetera? So, how, how do you think we can better engage uh, different stakeholders and uh, these, uh, you know, in order for our work to make uh, more impact? Yeah, so I'll just share a little bit about, there's a research center that I just helped co-found it at UW called CREATE, which stands for the Center for Research and Education on Accessible Technology and Experiences. That spells CREATE, actually. Uh, and um, one of the things that we're encountering is in looking at our counterpart centers across the country, and there are a few, the, probably the best known one is, is uh, the Trace Center. I mentioned it briefly in my talk, uh, founded and run by Greg Vanderheiden for many years, and now is being run at the University of Maryland by Jonathan Lazar. We're more of a technology research center. Uh, they have some of that, but actually they're very focused on policy, and being located in Maryland near Washington, D.C., they spend a lot of time over uh, in the federal government and even testifying in front of Congress and things. Because it's really apparent to us all in the accessibility field that even though we're focused on accessible computing, and there's a lot of great work here, I love the posters, uh, so much of it on accessible computing, if we don't engage with policy, we can only get so far. And some people really think that's interesting and want to get into that space, and other people, especially uh, you know, some of the more engineering-minded folks who really want to focus on the technology just really don't have a lot of interest in the policy side. And, and that's okay. We don't all have to do everything, of course. But um, it, it sort of puts a flight ceiling on how much impact the technology can have if we can't also engage with the policy side. And so many of the advances in accessibility over the last um, 50 years have been through policy and advocacy and activism. So we are starting an, an advocacy kind of branch of our center as well and uh, learning from the Trace Center in that process. So I would say public policy and legal type stuff is coming into play. Even though we focus mostly on technology, we can't avoid it. I guess my thinking, and it's a bit of a word of caution, is, and I was saying this to somebody earlier, we, we kind of go along and building on the work of those who came before us, standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were, who brought into being things like the Americans with Disabilities Act. But as we've seen, this can be very fragile, and I don't think we can ever be complacent about how much we rely on the Americans with Disabilities Act because it puts in place so much structure. It puts in, in place um, guardrails around uh, representation through government funding, through buying power of uh, federally funded agencies, which in turn then pushes back on people like Microsoft and Apple to make sure that their um, devices are accessible. But if that goes away, we, we lose a whole lot of those things that we depend on to make this whole thing stay together. So I think we can never be complacent and we can never stop 
uh, pushing and advocating, and if we have to, you know, getting out there on the streets. Um, so as an AI system designer, I think it's critically important to talk to the practitioners of the field for which we are developing those AI systems, because that's how you learn what the right problem specification is. As an example, I'll talk about the health behavior change work we did. Um, as soon as we talked to the clinicians for whom we were designing the app, um, they suddenly jumped on to, well, I really want the system to be safe because if it recommended exercises that would harm my patients, like I really don't want to that want that to happen and that goes against my HIPAA, oath, right? So the use of AI systems can bring these kinds of risks. And as AI systems people, we usually tend to approach it from the data first perspective. So we say, where is the data? What does it say? Let me try to build a system with it. And sometimes it leads us in a direction that might not work for the practitioner in the field, right? So talking to the practitioners, talking to the stakeholders is equally important as, or if not more than the technology itself, right? So that has been my biggest learning in trying to apply AI systems and AI technologies in different fields, is that talking to the practitioners, understanding what constraints they're working with, and then working with them to, towards the right problem formulation is critically important. All right, now I wanna open it up to the audience. I would like to ask a question about evaluation. So, um, I so I was uh, I have been trained as a kind of like an AI person. Uh, so, where we do evaluation mostly by we always build a pipeline where you know we use some data set and then we come up with some metric and then we you know uh, throw a bunch of like methods and try to achieve state of the art uh, performance on it. And then last year I took a, a HCI class. It struck to me that uh, people in HCI actually do things like contextual inquiry where they you know, iterate their product, um, you know, not necessarily just reporting a number, uh, but really care about what humans say about their product or, or algorithm. So I wonder, like, uh, since the panelists, a lot of people here are doing like AI and human, what is the best way to actually evaluate? Because like, the automate thing, they are certainly good you know, in terms of speed of iteration, but then on the other hand, like the contextual inquiry, like iterative process also provide more detailed feedback. Just wondering your opinion about this. Take. Oh, okay, sorry. No. Go ahead. All right, I'm gonna take a stab at this. Um, a lot of my work is at the intersection of those fields and so there's qualitative and quantitative evaluation, right? It's kind of subjective and objective. You can use different terms. Um, what I've found works well is to balance them, but ultimately to ask yourself, is this system supposed to help someone in some way, right? And so, um, I'm going to take explainable AI, which we've been working on recently, right? Explainable AI can be taken as an HCI problem. How can a computer communicate with you in a more clear, transparent way, right? Um, and so a lot of papers write uh, evaluations where they're like, oh, people like these explanations better than these other ones. But that's just like opinions, right? And, and, and that's a little bit unsatisfying from the AI side. So. We can ask that question, and we do, and that's like one of the plots that we report. But we also measure whether these explanations actionably improved somebody's ability to do something practical, right? Whether that's learning to play chess, which was something we explored. Because, hey, AI is way better at chess than any human, so if the AI can explain something to you, you'll be better, right, as well. Um, or um, helping them navigate to a new location in a new city or whatever it is, right? And so to me, um, f 
finding that intersection, I do care that users actually like those explanations, because otherwise you won't get adoption, right? And so you, you practicing uh, kind of user-centered design, right? We're starting to work with those users first to inspire the project, to inspire the problem you're trying to do. But then when you're coming in at the evaluation stage, trying to also find a task, a measurable task that people can do well. Then you get, it won't be a data set, right? And that's how it's different from what you're thinking of as AI, right? It won't be like, oh, I ran the numbers on the, inter on the data set, and guess what? My numbers are 2% better. Yay. Um, because we're talking about interaction. And as soon as you have users running on a data set, it becomes highly impractical. So assuming that we're talking about anything interactive, Try, try, try to find an actionable task that where you can measure performance, and then you can kind of find a really nice bridge between how AI people talk and how HCI people talk, because everybody cares about task performance um, as long as they like the task. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything that was just said. I, I think it's great also that you subjected yourself to a squishy, mushy HCI class. That's good for AI people to do. If you're an AI person in here and you haven't encountered the squishy, mushy side of computing, you should go get a little squishy and mushy because it's it's good. Um, I just wanted to add, because I, I think that was already a terrific answer, but people are notoriously bad at um, certain kinds of answers, and they're better at others. So for example, and, there's, and I can't summarize everything you should know in a quick answer. There's a whole methodology to all of this, right? I mean, it's, it's a whole area of expertise in itself. But for example, people are really, really bad at saying what they would use in the future. So if you say, would you like this? Would you use this? Would you adopt this? All of those answers are totally untrustworthy. No one uh, can predict what they would like, um, especially in isolation. But what people are really good at, and it's reliable, is if you show them multiple alternatives, even just two, and they try both, and then you say, which do you like better, that answer is actually really reliable. It doesn't mean they'd adopt it, it just means they like it better than the other thing. So if you show them A, B, and C, and, they, and you get a big preponderance of preferences for A, you can be pretty sure that A, in fact, is better than B and C, as far as people's subjective opinions go. So that's just one small example, but there's a whole methodology of things like that. Um, and that's not to say you can't still do a good job not being a full expert. I mean, you can you can get a long way with just a, a little bit. Um, but uh, it's, it's neither the case that asking people what they think is all bad or all good, right? Even in that, it's a mix. So you have to be a little bit careful about the kinds of things you're asking and what you're after in those. And I agree very much that um, objective measures coupled with subjective feedback is really important. Uh, you can even find cases where people say they didn't like something, but they perform much better with it. And things that they perform much worse with, they say they like better. All right? So that's why I said earlier it's a squishy, mushy thing, because humans are squishy and mushy and mostly water. So that's what you get. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I would add, I've been really enjoying the work coming out of a, a Holland, a group of people including Caroline Hummels and Jella van Ditch, D-I-J-K, if anybody's looking them up. Um, and they have been looking at sy systems which are deployed as long-term deployments in people's homes. And this, I think, is kind of getting to some of Sonia's work. When you are actually doing smart homes, these are things that have to be in people's environments. And their approach is something they call design for embodied being in the world. And it kind of acknowledges the work of a, um, I suppose, phenomenologist philosopher called uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who sort of said that, you know, anything we use becomes part of our lived environment. And if we're deploying these technologies long term, they're going to become part of people's lived environments. So the way you need to evaluate them is much more, it, it's subjective, but it's also, you need to spend more time observing too, because the depth and the, the subtlety and all of these things uh, that you need to get at when you're trying to integrate something into people's everyday life is so much greater. And I would say if you're looking at a really nice approach to these deep, engaged, long-term evaluations of embedded systems or you know, systems that are actually in people's environments, that, that body of work is really interesting. I just want to jump in real quick and 
build off these last two answers with a, with a something I learned in the last six months um, through our HCI partnership. And uh, we run a weekly think tank, right, with, with individuals with MCI. And um, before you get to go do that meeting, you get screened by HCI folks who tell you what you can and can't answer, ask. And they will um, shut you down if you come to the meeting and say, I'm going to say, here's this problem. What AI do you envision as solving this for society? And, um, and you don't, yeah, you don't get to, it doesn't work. Like, you can't ask that question. You'll get a really uh, an unnecessarily bad answer. So um, I'm really fortunate to have people training us not to ask such questions. So there you go. <laughs> Those are all great answers. I want to add, though, that having AI, or AI is helping us notice a gap in the science of experimentations as well, right? So the gold standard to evaluate the efficacy of a thing is a randomized control trial, right? So you split the group into two, you give the instrument to one, you don't give that, and then you see the efficacy of that. Now, what happens when you give one group an adaptive algorithm is that everyone in that group is now getting a different treatment. And there's, I talked to several econometricians and behavioral economists, psychologists, and no one had any idea of how to measure the impact of an adaptive system. So now there's a real gap, uh, and which was you know, punched open by an adaptive AI algorithmic thing. So I think we need to, so it's, I'm glad that you're thinking about experimentation, evaluation. I think these are complex things. Yeah, um, I have a question maybe about adaptive technology. Um, so um, I, I saw like a poster outside. It's about like um, DIY assisted technology designed by black people. And it's also what I'm thinking about like when you are offering like technology for people with disabilities, they are also like expert of themselves. So people are like more leaning towards like creating adaptive technology and have some DIY components in the product. Um, however, like not everyone has the knowledge to like manage or hack into that technology. Um, so I'm wondering what are like some current challenges or solutions to when it comes to DIY um, assisted technologies. Yeah, I'd love to take this because um, people with physical and, and any kind of disabilities are incredible at hacking their lives. They are some of the most creative people when it comes to getting up in the morning, figuring out how many impossible tasks are in front of them and figuring out a hack for every single one of them. So I think even given the smallest amount of push, they will learn what they have to. I've been surprised at how many people have learned how to do Alexa, what do you call those, uh, skills People I never thought had technical expertise, but they're hacking. So I would say, yes, it certainly is a challenge, but I wouldn't underestimate, you know, if the need is great, people will find a way to do it. Um, um, so that's one side of it. And the other is I think often technologies are overcomplicated. Um, I know people who can manage to do, blind people who can manage to do 3D printing, but it ought to be easier to do it because there are a lot of cases where you'd like to be able to 3D print a solution to a simple problem. Um, and, you know, it's still too hard. So some of it is that the technologies um, to do that, to come up with hacks yourselves are just not yet organized in a way that's accessible themselves. So I think there's a sort of two-stage part to the problem. Oh, this is yours, I think you just got in. <laughs> so I first wanted to say thank you for a set of very inspiring talks. And I'm a little afraid this will be a naive question. Um, but I think you all touched a little bit on how people's abilities change as they interact with technology over time. Um, whether that's robots in your house that kind of change what you expect to do. Do you expect the milk to be put away for you so you kind of don't have to think about that anymore? Is it easier to text while you're walking so maybe you're more likely to text while walking? Um, an embarrassing one from my personal experience, I find it very hard to parallel park without a backup cam now. So 
<laughs> I guess I was wondering what kind of the general knowledge and your individual ideas are on how people's abilities change as these technologies are developed and how much of that can you design for ahead of time? Uh, that's not a naive question. That's a great question. And thank you also for your talk. Um, yeah, and it's actually not just in response, changing abilities in response to t the technology, but it's actually in response to a, a host of factors, changing context, as well as, for example, medication um, or degrees, uh, disease progression in some cases, or a variety of other things. So there's sort of the only thing constant is change, right? Um, and so I think we have to start by acknowledging these are all dynamic environments and systems and humans, and so it's, it's all changing. And just start from that premise. Um, I, I think that is actually uh, a real challenge for both HCI and AI. Um, and you could speak to the latter better than I could, but the, the ability to have Continual, continual learning that is updating um, and learning as changes are taking place seems really paramount. And then on the HCI side, I think we have to remember that when we design interfaces and interactions for people, we're not, especially in an accessible computing situation, um, we're not, we can't, we don't have the luxury of regarding uh, those interactions as sort of stable and permanent. And so, it's sort of, to me, like the curb cut example, and which is used a lot in design in general, which is if you build, if you build in a curb cut from the beginning, uh, when you lay down the concrete for a curb, it's not only more accessible, but it's more cost effective and better design right from the start. But if you don't put it there, and then you have to cut it out later, it's much more expensive. It turns out worse, and it's more labor intensive, not to mention inaccessible for a long time. So if we start from the right premise from the beginning, I think that can get us a long way. Um, and if we start with the wrong assumptions, especially ability assumptions, and then we realize those are incorrect, then we're kind of jackhammering out some retrofit that ends up putting lipstick on a pig but doesn't really solve the underlying problem. It's still a pig. As far as designing for it, I. You know, the only suggestion I have, if you can predict the future, that'd be great, right? But uh, if you can't, try not to lock your system down into just one way of interacting with it, right? And Or one narrow view of, of how it will be applied. And um, the many, many ways to do that that, that uh, we could just, you know, is a different discussion. But if, if you could find a way to be open minded about both the way it's interacted with and the types of data or, or it, you know, ex exposure for this system or how it's being used, you're going to future proof it much more, right? Um, that's that's it. the best we can do if we can't predict the future. There's a lovely concept that comes, again, from computer music, where we often think about skill acquisition and designing musical instruments for people who may not be professional musicians, which I think also applies here, which is this idea of a low floor, high ceiling. So you need to design technologies for people who can come in with some you know, basic level of skill, but allow for people to become expert users too. And I think that leaves plenty of room for the system to be adaptive to people's needs as they change, but also as people become more skilled. So that would be one thought I would have. Can I just add a note on that? That's, I love that. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, add that. So there's a, um, a story that's often told, again, in HCI and design classes about the question, what's more usable, a kazoo or a violin? Everybody know what a kazoo is? <laughs> it's a little canoe-looking thing that... So uh, if you walk up and grab a kazoo for the first time, you're going to be pretty darn good in about three minutes. And you're not ever going to really be much better because you just put it in your mouth and you do the little hum thing and you can do, you know, Mary had a little lamb and it's about as good as you can get. With a violin, obviously, the ceiling is almost infinitely higher and you can become very proficient but right at the beginning you're not very good and a lot of uh, in a lot of 
projects, we we don't mean to, but we're, or we don't think about it too much, but we're assuming that everything needs to be usable from the first moment, um, like a kazoo. But if you think about it, systems vary in their use context. So if you walk up to a kiosk in an airport to check in for your flight, that's a kazoo. That should be usable with no prior training for the most part, right? And even then, as we talked about, you know, it's not just touch the screen. So there may be more complexity there than at first it seems. Um, that's very different than teaching someone to use, you know, Emacs or something and learn the, all the shortcuts and, you know, command line secrets and everything. So that's more like the violin. So so I guess the, the point is to also figure out where, like, where are you in that spectrum? If you have, I'm going to totally overstep my expertise here, but if you have a robot living in your house, it might seem like maybe it's okay if you get to know each other for a week. If you're going to have that robot for like 10 years and it's going to serve you over time, sure, I'll get to know you for a week before, you know, I let you in my bedroom, right? So, uh, so there's maybe a chance to like evolve and not just have to be everything be like instantly usable from the first moment. So is it a kazoo or a violin or something in between? You know, is I think a, a good question to keep in mind when creating technology. I, I think we can conclude this panel. Let's thank all the panelists once again. Okay, I think next we'll move on to the closing remarks. What a day. Although we're at the end of the uh, program, I still feel very excited and also in some way refreshed because it really gave me a lot of questions to think about after today. So um, now we come to the closing session. Um, first, I would like to invite uh, our poster co-chairs come here to the um, stage to present the, our poster awards. Um, thanks all for the wonderful like presentation and demos today. And we got a lot of uh, responses for our forms. And uh, uh, for this year's symposium, uh, we have three different awards. One is uh, best poster, best poster award, and there's also a best demo award, and also a uh, most impactful for society award. So, um, so our best poster award will be. Moves, moving objects in video enables segmentation, and let's give applause to the uh, audience. Is, <laughs> is Richard still here? <laughs> All right, I will keep it for now, and I will just probably they can pick it up later. Um, Best demo award will be given to Rubicon, a multimodal tutor for 3D physical task learning. Congratulations. <laughs> and if you are the yeah, presenters, you can. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, our most impactful for society award will be given to Image Explorer. Thank you.